Excellent. Our main text today will be the book of Jonah. If you could turn with me. Uh, the pastor has been doing the heavy lifting of trying to do the Bible in a year. I, um, he's in my prayers for that. But um, in a very simple way, I'm going to try to carry that through and see if we can do the whole Bible in a single book of Jonah. Now I'm going to give you the references. You don't need to bounce back and forth with me. Um, I think the scriptures and the video will be on YouTube later this week. Sounds a little hot. All right, let us just pray. Lord, we just give you thanks for uh, time to safely gather in your name in this country still, uh, that we have such a richness of your scriptures and uh, resources to share. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher this morning, and please um, remove me, Lord. You be the teacher. Let everyone hear what they need to hear today. We give you thanks for this opportunity in Jesus' name. All right. For context in the book of Jonah, I'm going to start in Luke chapter 11, verse 29. It says of Jesus, And when the multitudes were gathering together unto him, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For even as Jonah became a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and shall condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, the greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall stand up in, in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus says that the men of Nineveh repented. Okay, that same Greek word, metanoia. This is what we're called to do. When in Acts chapter th 2, verse 38, the men said, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized. First words of Jesus in ministry. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 4, he says, repent. Right, this is it. And we see that the men of Nineveh will repent. Uh, for context on this passage, we see that Jesus claims to be greater than Jonah. That's why we're going to look at the book of Jonah. Many scholars today are divided on how to interpret the book of Jonah. Many claiming that the book of Jonah is simply an allegory. Okay, if you happen to find such a teacher who's going to stand up here and say that Jonah is just an allegory, Take that moment, get up and leave. Okay, we cannot affect the culture around us if we undermine the word of God. If Jesus quoted from Jonah and he said he's greater than Jonah and Jonah was just a play, well then his ministry is useless and we have no authority. We start to undermine our authority in the culture if we undermine the word of God that we're standing on. God's word claims that every word is born on the testimony of two or three witnesses. In Deuteronomy 19.15, we see it says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity. At the mouth of three witnesses, a matter shall be established. Drawing on that, Paul in 1 Timothy 5.19 also says, Except at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall we receive a testimony. The prophet Jonah has two other witnesses than himself in the scripture. In 2 Kings 14.25, it speaks of King Jer Jeroboam, the son of Joash, and says that he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath unto the sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which had spoken by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. Okay. Pastor has asked us to get a 
find access to a narrated Bible, a chronological Bible. I have one by a man named F. Lagarde Smith. Okay, it's not authoritative, but he does a good job in trying to put everything in line. The scriptures, the prophets, the minor prophets, the historical books. And he puts this ministry of Jonah to King Jeroboam after the book of Jonah. So whatever failings Jonah had as a minister, he was still a man of God. And we see that failings don't disqualify us from the ministry. That's the best part. You know, we have um, the history of, excuse me, a little hot on the mic. Um, Uh, remember the story of Gehazi when he went and followed Naaman and tried to get payment for the healing that Elisha brought to Naaman. Gehazi sinned and went after the man and said, give me some silver, give me some clothes. Some men had come. Elisha said, I saw what you did. We know that you've sinned. This leprosy that was on Naaman is on you forever. But we see in chapter 6 of 2 Kings, two chapters later, that Gehazi is still the servant of the man of God. In chapter 8, he's still the servant of the man of God. The good news is that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Okay. So a little interest and a little background in the interest of time. Jonah's name means dove. Okay, he wrote a book to the Ninevites. A hundred years later, this same audience is going to get a second book by a prophet named Nahum. Jonah brings a story that says, please repent. Nahum, whose name means compassion, brings a judgment. You should have repented. And starting in Nahum 1 2, he says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So Nahum comes right out and says, you should have repented. We're in an age of grace. Jesus Christ has come. He's asked us to repent. We're in an interlude now. He's coming back. And when he comes, he's not going to be this blonde, blue-eyed hippie running around and saying, hey, have a good time. He's going to say, the game's over. You should have repented. So we see that both names, the dove and compassion, they both are characteristics of Jesus. They're both messages. Jesus says to repent. And then when he comes again, he's going to say, it's time for judgment. The time for repenting, the time for saying you're sorry is all over. Okay? In um, Luke chapter 4, verse 17 to 19, we see Jesus quoting Isaiah 61. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now, if you read Luke chapter 4, verse 17 to 19, Jesus stops the quote. Jesus says, He stops, he says, I'm here to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and then closes the book. Everybody in the audience is waiting. Where's the justice? Where's the vengeance? 
It's not yet. Praise God. But when he comes again, he will proclaim the day of God's vengeance. In that comfort that he brings mercy and justice should bring us all comfort. Okay. Um, just a little more background. In 2 Kings 4.25, it says that Jonah came from gath Hefer. Right, gath Hefer is on the, bo- the boundary of the land of Naphtali and the land of Zebulun. In Isaiah 9.1, Isaiah declares that Naphtali and Zebulun are in the land of the Gentiles. Okay? And he says that the Gentiles will find a great light. The Jews miss it, but the Gentiles in this area find a great light. So how can the teachers in John chapter 7, verse 52 say that no prophet has risen out of the Galilee? I think Jonah was disqualified because he witnessed to the Gentiles. There were many prophets that came out of the Galilee, yet they were disqualified. Don't let anybody disqualify you because of your ministry. You minister where you're sent, where you're called. Jesus replied to them in Mark chapter 6. He said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own home and among his own people. So as we look through the scriptures, remember that the best commentary on the scripture is the scripture. So I'm going to read chapter 1, break down chapter 1, skate through some of the highlights of chapter 2 and 3 and 4. So turn with me to Jonah Chapter 1. I'll be reading out of the New King James. Hmm. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us, so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. Then he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land. But they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. 
Then the men, the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Amazing. Pretty frightening if it's true, and I believe it is true. That's why they want to wish it away and make it just a good story. It's interesting, in the very first verse, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Okay, it doesn't say Jonah heard a voice. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Right, John 1, 1, he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. In Genesis 15, it says that the word of the Lord came to Abram, incarnate. He spoke to Abram. Abram called him Lord God. Okay, Jesus came to Jonah and said, Jonah, you have to go to Nineveh. And what did Jonah do? He tried to escape the presence of the Lord. He was in the presence of the Lord, and he tried to run away. David would say that's impossible. And we're going to see that it is impossible. He says, arise, go to Nineveh, the worst of the worst, the worst place to go. But this is the people that God wants to save. The lost are so lost, they don't even know. They're doing things that are despicable. And why is it? Because they don't know God. We can't blame them. We can't hate them. We have to go to them. Remember, it was the Lord himself that went down to see what was happening in Babel in Genesis 11. Okay. Now, it's not as if the, the Lord didn't know what was happening in Nineveh, but they had ignored the grace of God long enough. In 2 Peter 3.9, it says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Friends, neighbors, people around us, they're going to hell. There's no other option. We're gonna see it here at the end of the book of Jonah. There's no other option. Two places, heaven or hell. And how are they gonna know what the difference is if we don't tell them? I was reflecting on this and it just said, you know, to Nineveh, the Lord sent Jonah. But to Israel and to us, he sent his son. In verse three, it says that Jonah goes in the opposite direction, trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. And we always see the preposition going down. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship, went down to the low, excuse me, lowest part of the ship, trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. You know, it's interesting that he went to Joppa. Later in Acts chapter 10, Pastor shared with us a couple of weeks ago, we saw that Simon was in, Simon Peter was in Joppa. He, he was a reluctant minister, a reluctant prophet sent to the Gentile world. And in Acts, and I'm sorry, in uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, you remember we said uh, Jesus referred to Peter as Simon Bar-Jonah. He says, Peter, you're just like Jonah. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles and you don't want to go. But we have to go. It says that Jonah paid the fare. It's amazing that the Lord puts that detail in that. You want to go your own way? You want to pay your own way? It's going to cost you everything. And you have nothing to show for it when you're done. Jonah didn't get a refund when the fish spit him back out. That was gone. That was lost. But he did have his testimony. Um, where is Tarshish? Doesn't really matter. Some people say it's Spain. Some people say it's even further out in the ocean, England. But what it was to the Jews, to this audience, it's the furthest place away. And we can try to run away, try to run away, but God is there. And however fast we're running away from him where he is here, 
were running into his arms there. It's very interesting that Paul tried to get to Tarshish. That was the goal when he was on his way to Rome. He was never allowed to get there. We will never reach the end of God's kingdom. We will never reach the end of where he's trying to send us. Verses four through seven, Jonah is clearly in sin and he's in the presence of others. You know, you've heard the phrase that our sin looks terrible on others, but how much worse does the sin of a Christian look to the lost, right? I don't know if you've ever had the conviction of a coworker saying, I didn't know you were a Christian, or even worse, somebody said, I thought you were a Christian, right? It's no matter what our witness is, the world is watching. Some of us, they want to succeed, right? Because they want it to be true. But others, they're like, I hope that man fails because then I don't have to turn my life around. Okay, Jonah was clearly in sin. And we see that the Lord hurled a great wind. It was the Lord's doing, the natural consequence. The Lord had to get his attention because the Lord wasn't gonna find somebody else to do his job. The Lord wasn't gonna say, okay, Jonah, you don't wanna do it, I'll find somebody else. He had a job to do. And it's um, in Romans chapter 11, it says that the gifts and callings of the Lord are given without repentance. He doesn't take them back. He doesn't say, oh, you're uncomfortable with that? I'll find somebody else. No, he's gonna make you do it. Kicking or screaming. It says that the sailors became very afraid and every man called on his God. Right, we look around. The world is full of systems, methods, and religions. These sailors being world, travel, world travelers were probably familiar with many different gods and the followers of each god. So who are these gods that the sailors knew of? Both Old and New Testament agree that these are demons. In Deuteronomy 32, 17, Moses says that they sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods that they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. In 1 Corinthians 10, 20, Paul says, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I would that you, I would not that ye should be participants with demons. Pretty clear. Anyone who stands in the way of your worship of God is a usurper. Okay, verse nine and 10, we see that the, the captain says, why have you done this to us? Right? If believers go into the lost, what they're doing, they, no one's going to have any peace. Right? We've met people in ministry that have too much of Jesus to have peace in the world, but too much of the world to have any effect in ministry. We need to work that out. We need to be separate. We need to be called out and to do what the Lord asks us to do the first time. In verse 11, you see the sailors say, what must we do to you? that the sea must be calm for them. That shows a great understanding. God's trying to get your attention, Jonah. What do we have to do to you so that he can stop chasing us? Right, even in our worst witness, the world sees a difference. Jonah says, lift me up and throw me into the sea and the sea will be calm for you. Remember Jesus told Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the brazen serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up in John 3.14. He was referencing uh, Numbers chapter 21. In John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. The hearers in John chapter 12 knew that he was talking of his death. So Jonah says, if you want peace with God, you have to lift me up. It's unfortunate, but somebody had to die for me to have peace with God. So we see that work of the cross right there. It's just being typed 
Jesus says, what's the sign of Jonah? You have to pick the prophet up and he has to die for you to have peace. In Acts chapter two, verse 38, as I said, the men of Jerusalem asked Peter, what must we do? And the answer was to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 16, 30, the Philippian jailer asked a similar question, what must I do to be saved? The answer is always the same, repent. You know, as it is right now, we're in a lost world. Some people are getting saved, but many are just denying it. How can we show the world Jesus? Jesus told us to take up our cross and follow him. Paul exhorted the Roman church to present your bodies as living sacrifices. If we deny our rights and preferences, some may come to the Lord. Right? John, in John chapter 15, Jesus says, No greater love has any man than this, than one would lay his life down for a brother. If we lay our lives down, sacrifice our preferences, our rights, we can show the world Jesus. It's interesting that in this passage that the sailors prayed to the Lord, they called on the covenant name of God. So whatever witness Jonah had in their limited time, he taught them who God was. And they repented. They started to make vows to God. They were led to understanding of who his God was. It says that they prayed to the Lord that Jonah's blood would not be charged to them. Remember another Gentile, Pilate, he washed his hands to be clean of Jesus' blood. He says, this man is innocent. However, there were some in the crowd in Matthew 27, verses 24 to 25, that claimed, responsible, claimed responsibility for his blood. They said, his blood be on us and our children. And it will be until we have that removed by the grace of God. You and I are both responsible for the blood of Jesus. He came to save you. It's why he took the cross. If I was the only one that ever would get saved, he still needed to take the cross. And if we confess that truth and repent of our sins, we will be forgiven. It's very interesting. They threw him in the sea and the sea became calm for them. The wrath of God was satisfied against the men in the boat. On the cross, the wrath of God was satisfied against this world. Anybody who will move forward in that truth can have peace with God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We see the sea become calm for the sailors, and it says right away that they worship the God of Jonah. Remember at the cross in Matthew 27, verse 54, the centurion who was mocking moments, moments before, as Jesus breathed his last, declared him to, quote, be truly the Son of God. There's something about looking at the cross in truth, meditating on it. It says it, he is the Son of God. We see another similar instance of three witnesses giving their lives, so to speak, in Daniel chapter three, the three young men who were thrown in the furnace. They didn't put up a fight. They said, pick us up, throw us in. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar in, jo in Daniel chapter four, if you read that, it'll be very hard to understand that he was not a believer in the God of the three that went before him, that he took on faith in the God of Daniel. Back to Jonah, verse seven, uh, 117, it says, the Lord had prepared a fish. See the hand of the Lord in all of these circumstances. The Lord wasn't shocked by Jonah's decision. He is way ahead of us. It's interesting that the, as believers, 
We are the only part of God's creation that can say no or wait. We see the ocean picked up a storm because God threw a wind. We see the fish came because God called the fish. The sailors did what the sailors did because they didn't have any authority to say no. But Jonah, a man in relationship with God, God says, you're my friend, I wanna tell you my plan. And Jonah says, no. That's an awesome responsibility we have as believers. That's why I think the Lord speaks to us many times early and says, I want you to do this in two or three years. Because if we, if he said today, it would be too hard to do it. But he says, I want you to do this. And we say no, and then we, our mind comes back to his mind. Okay. And Jesus did say that. He says he no longer calls us servants, but friends. And a friend tells his friends his plans. This is an awesome and terrifying responsibility. The fish was prepared and ready to meet Jonah. You know, many times it, circumstances might seem very bad. I don't like what happened, but we missed something that was much worse, right? Oh, we had a flat tire. I'm five minutes later than I needed to be, and there's an accident right up the road. So many times we can just say, you know, if I had made that decision, what I wanted to, wanted to do, it would have been very bad. I didn't like the circumstance. I didn't like what I was facing but the Lord prevented me and protected me from something much worse, right? Who could think of anything being worse than being eaten by a fish? Well, standing in the middle of the ocean for a month would be worse. He would have drowned, he would have drowned in a day. But the Lord prepared the fish and said, I'm gonna protect you. It looks like it's bad, it feels bad, but it's the best space for you right now. I have many friends who are only effective and only healthy in prison. Outside in the world, they just get chewed up and spit out. They never get out of their cycle, the people, places, and things. But God was gracious in saying, I'm going to put you in this cell, keep you safe, keep you well fed, and give you time to read the word all day long. And they can thrive in there. Some people just need to be in the belly of the fish and God will prepare it. Romans 8.28 says, God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. You know, we see death and illness as bad things, but remember, they're working for our good. I mean, I'm 54 years old, things don't work like they used to. Can you imagine getting older forever? No. And not in this sin fallen world. Remember the first thing they did after the fall, God said, no access to the tree of life. They cannot live forever in a fallen state. So he gave us the gift of death and illness. It makes every moment that we have between now and then precious. If we lived forever, nothing would be precious. Right? We would. I'll get to that some other time. I'll get to that in a thousand years. It doesn't matter. But we have limited time. That's why we have to take advantage of it. All right, believe it or not, chapter two. How stubborn was Jonah in the belly for three days before he prays? I think I would have been in his mouth praying, right? I would have been... I would have been praying in the water, but he was in the fish for three days before he prayed. Verse two, it says, I cried to the Lord. He uses the covenant name of God, which is the only one worthy of our prayers. Out of the belly of Sheol. Right, he mixes it right here. That word Sheol is the word for the grave. Sometimes it's translated hell in your Old Testament, but it's really the place of the dead. And he calls it the belly. He's in the fish and he feels dead. Um, I'm gonna see it later and I think that he was dead. Verse three, Jonah uses the pronoun you. You cast me into the deep. From the reading, we see that it was the sailors who cast him into the deep. 
but he knows that this is part of God's plan. You cast me into the deep. He says, all your billows and your waves passed over me. It's interesting, he used all. Jonah took God's judgment in this case in full measure. Didn't equivocate, didn't say put me out somewhere else. He took all of the waves. Remember Jesus on the cross, he took the cup of God's wrath in full measure. Didn't dilute it, didn't get around it. Verse four, then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. In chapter one, Jonah declared God to be the God of heaven and earth, creator of everything. How could he get out of God's sight? But he feels as if he's been cast out of God's sight. Mark 15, verse 33, Jesus quoted the 22nd Psalm. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus also felt abandoned on the cross. David, at different times, felt similarly, similarly abandoned in times of great distress. Jonah says, yet I will look to your holy temple. Now, in the belly of a fish, how he found east, I don't know, but he was able to do it. He says, maybe just in his spirit, he says, I'm going to look towards your temple. At the dedication of the temple, Solomon prayed that God would hear any prayer offered toward the temple and forgive any in affliction. That's 2 Chronicles 6, verse 19. In Jonah, verse 5, he says, The waters surround me, even to my soul. Remember on the cross, Psalm 22, he says, I thirst. My tongue cleaves. Okay, what's happening? He's getting fully dehydrated. Every cell is rupturing. The water from his cells is just swimming into his chest. Okay, so similarly, sometimes they say that crucifixion is almost like drowning. When the spear went through his side, it was water and blood that separated. Right, his heart was full, fully encased in water just like Jonah. Verse 5, Jonah says, Weeds were wrapped around my head. On the cross, Jesus had thorns wrapped around his head. Very similar to the thorns that were wrapped around the ram that was provided as a substitute for Isaac in Genesis 22. So we see a picture. Jesus is saying, read the book of Jonah, see where I am. And I think pastor in his study trying to do the whole Bible, we have to look and see if we can't find Jesus on every page, we're not looking hard enough. Why did he say it's the sign of Jonah? There was a prophet that had to die to bring men peace. And I believe that he died. Right, verse six in Jonah chapter two, he says, I went down to the moorings of the mountains In Proverbs chapter 8 and in verb, I'm sorry, in Job chapter 38 and Proverbs chapter 8, you see depictions of the creation. And it says that the mountains have foundations. Okay, it was a little hot. So we see this type of language in the creation narrative. Verse 6, he also says, the earth closed behind me forever. That word really got my attention this week. Forever. Jonah was in the belly for three days, but he says that the doors closed behind him forever. Going back to the cross, Jesus felt abandoned by the Father. He had intimate relationship and perfect harmony from way beyond the creation. Yet at some point on the cross, he was abandoned separated, right? That's our definition of hell. Hell is to be separated from God, right? To the lost, somebody who's not going to heaven, this is the closest 
to heaven they're ever going to get. For the believer, this is the closest to hell we're ever going to get. But at some point, Jesus says he was separated from the Father. That's a torment of hell. I didn't say that he went to hell, but he felt it. He paid the penalty. He paid my eternal punishment in a single afternoon, forever. How is that possible? I don't know. I just need to say that the quantity of time wasn't what was there. It was the quality of time. It's who Jesus is and what it meant for him to be separated from the Father would be equivalent to countless eternities of separation. Anytime we've seen a movie depiction of the cross, the beating is terrible. The physical pain is unbelievable. But just try to grapple with what was happening in his spirit as he was separated. Jonah says that he was closed off forever. Okay, in Galatians 3.13, Paul says of Jesus that he redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse. There was a transformation, there was a transferal of my sin and my debt that Jesus had to take. And that's an eternity. I don't know how he paid it, but he did. Okay, verse 6 Jonah says, yet you brought my life up out of the pit. He was restored to life. Okay, the good news is is three days after the crucifixion, Jesus came out of that grave. This prophet was restored, returned. Uh, Verse 7, this is what it says, uh, 2-7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Okay, that word for soul, you know, mind, will, and emotions. Uh, The Greeks would say the heart. The heart was the seat of the emotion. And that word for fainted was failed. His heart failed. He was done. I don't think, I think at this point, Jonah was completely dead. Now, if you don't believe that, that's okay. It's not a, that's not a fellowship breaker. Okay, verse 8 in chapter 2, he says, Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. That is a powerful statement. The one who worships an idol forsakes his own mercy. The only mercy that we have is through Jesus. If we worship idols, we turn our back on the only mercy that's available. Okay, Jesus alone paid the price. He alone satisfied God's wrath. If we choose any other option, what chance do we have? Verse 9 in chapter 2, he says, I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. That's that moment we have to come to when we wrestle with God. Remember, Jacob wrestled with the Lord all night long, and he says, I'm not going to leave you until you bless me. And the Lord didn't have a big list of demands. He just asked him one question. What's your name? And Jacob had to get real and said, yeah, I'm the deceiver. I'm the liar. In that confession, the Lord said, no longer Jacob, but Israel, the one governed by God. If we come to that point in ourselves where I say, I will pay what I have vowed. I made a promise to Jesus one morning. I would follow him. It's been imperfect since then. But if I turn that around and say, I will pay, I will follow through on what I vowed, and the confirmation that salvation is of the Lord. That's what we need to do. Uh, Just as the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, he came to the end of himself, it says. There's been many times on the road I've met people, and I just ask them one question. Can we call this rock bottom? Can we say this is, we've gone thus far, and can we turn around and go back to Jesus from here? He's always willing to take us. There's hope for all that are in flesh. 
and that is the good news. Verse 10, it says, so the Lord spoke to the fish. That fish must have been moving towards the land. I think God knew what was happening in Jonah's heart. Didn't take too long and said, okay, as soon as we come to the end of ourselves, we're at our destination. Remember when the men were rowing across the boat and Jesus walked on the water? When they brought him on the boat in the Gospel of John, it says they were already at the other side. From halfway across the lake to the other side, just like that, by bringing Jesus on the boat. Uh, uh, chapter 3, I think I'm going to take a couple highlights in Jonah chapter 3. Verse 1, now the word came a second time. The word. Right? Be careful if somebody says, hey, I have a word for you. We want the word. And it's the word that came to Jonah a second time. Not a different word. Nothing changed. Jonah had to change. Right? It's good. We serve a God of second and third chances. Praise him for his patience with us. We notice that the word of God did not change. It was Jonah that needed to change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? There was no changing. There was no, oh, okay, Jonah, I know you didn't want to do that. Let me give you this other ministry over here. Right? If you ever are in prayer and God speaks to your heart and you don't like the answer, you have to change. Don't go someplace else looking for a new word or a different answer or somebody else to change your mind for you, right? Um, in prayer, in clarity, when you're looking for clarity or direction, I always say, do what Jesus said to do last time. In John chapter two, verse five, we read the last recorded words of Mary. At the wedding, she told the servants, whatever he says to do, do it. That's the confidence we have to have. Whatever he says to do, do it. Now Jonah went, but he hadn't been given the message yet. He would be given that message after he entered the city. There's so many times when we want more information before we step out. He told the priests one time to walk into the river while it was raging, and then it would separate. We're waiting for it to be clear and smooth sailing, and then we'll get the direction to go. Sometimes the Lord says, just step in and trust me. It's that obedience that he follows through. Uh, in verse 4, Jonah cried out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Not the most friendly message. Not very seeker-sensitive. But it was truth. I have written here, the message will not change, but it must change us. Right? We say it's the same sun that makes the wax melt, that makes the clay hard. Right? The message is going to go out. Some will respond to it and some will not. We can't change the message. In verse 5, it says, of chapter 3, it says that the Ninevites believed God. It's interesting, the word there for God is Elohim. In chapter 1, verse 16, it says that the, believe, that the sailors believed in Yahweh. So there's a different level of understanding. The sailors, seeing the impact on what happened to them directly, they believed in the covenant name of God. They said, this is the one and only God. But the Ninevites, seeing this man walk through, they said, we need to change. We're going to try to follow. And there's kind of this imperfect following through with, and they follow. It says that they believed Elohim. But remember, Jesus says that they repented. So that first step, however imperfect, we just have to keep walking towards Jesus. He's going to meet us, right? He says, submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. And that's what we have to do. If we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. The kings and the subjects humbled themselves before God with imperfect understanding. 
Right? God met them in their attempt to get back to right relationship. In uh, 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 12, Paul says, We now see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Right? We don't have the perfect call right now. You might not have perfect clarity on what God's asking you to do moving forward, but just trust him, follow him, and keep seeking him. There was a time when God told Miriam that she should not have despised Moses, the man of God. She said, the Lord said to Miriam that he spoke to Moses face to face. Right In our prayer, we have to be in that moment where we can pray to God and let him speak to us face to face. I was convicted of this this week. I said, um, you know, I'm just so glad that Jesus is not looking for fine print to keep us out of his kingdom. The good news is if you want to be with Jesus, he wants to be with you more. You know, you don't, oh, I don't know what that says. I don't know everything. If you want to be with Jesus... Let him know. He wants to be with you more. He loves you. He died for you. Verse, two, verse 10 in chapter 3. It says, God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways, and he relented. God held out his hand of chastisement based on their works. Is Jonah teaching a work salvation? Can we get to right relationship with God through work? No. Earlier in the chapter, it says that they believed. And what, did the, what was the impact of that belief? They changed their behaviors. Right? In 1 John, it says that the one who works righteousness is righteous. And there's no way that we can work righteousness outside of the righteousness of Christ. So if we're doing things that are righteous, that means that we're already in right standing with God. In Revelations 3.15, Jesus told the church at Laodicea, he says, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. The works demonstrate the heart. What are you doing in this world proves what you believe. James would say, faith without works is dead. He would also say, show me your faith by your works. Okay, so you see this amazing ministry. Jonah, not with the best attitude, walks in, brings this heavy-handed message, and the people repent. If you went out and you had a revival and 100,000 people got saved, you'd be pretty excited. Not Jonah. It angered Jonah that the Lord relented. Jonah wanted Nineveh to look like Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see this conversation between the Lord and Jonah. This is Jonah's real, raw emotion. You know, it's amazing. God still uses flawed vessels. How do I know you're looking at one? The Bible is not sanitized. Perfect people doing perfect things. It's broken people making a mess of themselves and God reaching in and saying, I can still use that for his glory, for his glory. It shows us who we are and at every step our need for God. Although Jonah is the man of God called to be a prophet before his call to Nineveh and after, he fails to take joy in the conversion of the city. Verse 9, God asked a probing question to get at the very heart of Jonah. Verse 9, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Remember, Jonah was sitting waiting for the city to burn, and he got sunstroke, and the Lord said, I'll give him a little protection here, I'll give him a plant. And then there was a worm that killed the plant, and Jonah got mad again. You see, it's kind of a humorous play, but 
Jonah is still taking his eyes on his circumstances. I'm happy because this is working out. I'm sad because this is not working out. Right? The word happy has the same root as the word happenstance. It's just worship of luck. Right? Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Isaiah chapter 66 would say, hey, don't do that. Don't worship luck. But they do. They still worship their circumstances. We're not called to be happy. We're called to have the joy of the Lord. Right? And joy is that ever-present feeling, that ever-present knowledge that God has our good. And I'm sure if we looked at it, we would laugh at Jonah and say, Jonah, you're being silly and petty. But if we put our angers before the Lord, our hurts, our disappointments, we would look just as petty, just as silly, because we're basing it on happenstance. We're basing it on the outward circumstances, taking our eyes off of the joy that he wants us to share with. Now, a quick study if you wanted to do on your home time. Just do a search for what's called imprecatory psalms. Right? There are probably 15 psalms where you read David, and he's raining down curses on the enemy of God. Some are justified. He says, God, they put their hands on your people. They shed your people's blood in this city. Destroy them. But as we do that, as we pour out our emotion... Sometimes bringing that into the light, hearing ourselves make these statements, we see that God is good, and our heart will change. Many times David prayed anger and venom on people, but we see that through the prayer, through the pouring out of that emotion, sorry, that he gets his perspective right. In Jonah the same way. He was able to, uh, did that go off? Okay, good. Uh, All right, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Peter tells us, uh, or says to us, casting all of your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. This is how we set our perspective right. Cares, fears, worries, doubts, anxieties, Put them all on the burden of the Lord because he, is, he wants to carry them and he cares for you. If you let the Lord know about your hurts, your fears, your concerns, they get exposed to the light. God is big enough to hear you out. He is loving enough to let you have a moment and gentle enough to give you an answer. Even if you don't like the answer, we must trust that he is good and he will continue to do good. Remember, Abram said to the Lord, will not the God of all the earth do right? In Genesis 18, uh, 25. We have to understand that God's ways are not our ways. Jonah was a prophet whose message was heard even though his heart was not in delivering it. We have confidence that all scriptures God breathed and profitable for doctrine, doctrine, excuse me, correction and instruction in righteousness. God called on Jonah to be his prophet. And God saw Jonah through the ministry. Jesus told his hearers that he would give them the sign of Jonah. I believe that there are many signs that confirm Jesus was who he claimed to be. And we should be able to find him on every page of the scripture. So we see in this type that the Lord is drawing our attention to this prophet. And I think that if we see Jesus in this, we'll get an understanding of what he was trying to teach the people at that time. 